Good evening. My name is Shin Yi Pai, and I'm Program Director at Town Hall. On behalf of the staff at Town Hall Seattle and our friends at Elliott Bay Books, it's my pleasure to welcome you to our presentation with Howard Zare and Barb Taze with Omari Amili. Zare and Taze's new book, Still Doing Life, 22 Lifers, 25 Years Later, is the subject of tonight's talk. As we get underway, I would like to acknowledge our institution stands on the unceded traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Duwamish. We thank them for our continuing use of the natural resources of their ancestral homeland. We're so glad to have you join us today. The presentation will run about 60 minutes, including Q&A. To submit your questions for the Q&A portion of the event, please enter meet.ps backslash Zare or scan the QR code right now on the screen with your smartphone. We'll drop this link in the chat as well, and you can submit a question at any time. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible. And if you can help us by keeping your own question concise, also, a reminder, if you'd like to view the program with closed captions, click the CC button in the bottom right corner of the video player. Town Hall continues to add new events and podcasts every day. Tomorrow night, Monica Guzman and David Horsey discuss how we can be fearlessly curious in a time of seemingly unprecedented polarization. And on Wednesday, Daniel Byman and C.E. Bick discuss the evolution and threat of the white power movement. Visit our website to join our email list and get the latest updates as more programs are added throughout the season. Town Hall's work is made possible through your support and the support of our sponsors. Our civic series is supported by Real Networks Foundation and True Brown Foundation. Town Hall is also a member supported organization, so I'd like to thank all of the members who are joining us. If you share Town Hall's vision of a community strengthened by discussions about civic science and culture where everyone has a voice, please consider supporting us by donating or becoming a member. Lastly, you'll absolutely want to dig into tonight's topic by purchasing your own copy of the author's book. Please use the link in the chat below to pick up your copy through Elliott Bay Books. Howard Zare is a distinguished professor of restorative justice at Eastern Mennonite University's Center for Justice and Peacebuilding. He is the author of the best-selling The Little Book of Restorative Justice and Doing Life, among other titles. Barb Tays is Associate Professor of Criminal Justice at the University of Washington, Tacoma. She is the author of The Little Book of Restorative Justice for People in Prison and the co-author with Howard Zer of Critical Issues in Restorative Justice. Tays is the editor of The Little Books in Restorative Justice series and lives in Tacoma. Omari Emily is an author, educator, and father of six from Seattle, Washington. With a childhood dominated by chronic instability rooted in his parents' addiction, Omari found himself a product of the school-to-prison pipeline. After serving time on 30 felony convictions for bank fraud, he turned his life around and pursued post-secondary education, climbing from a GED to a master's degree. Omari's journey is evidence that there can be life after incarceration, and he has made it his personal mission to change the narrative and introduce new possibilities for individuals from backgrounds similar to his. Please join me in welcoming Howard Zare, Barb Tays, and Omari Emily. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. I am glad to be here in conversation with you all. We're going to be here together for an hour talking about the new book, Still Doing Life, 22 Lifers, 25 Years Later. First thing I'm going to do is share just a quick description of the book that we're going to be discussing today, and then we'll have some questions for our great panelists here. So in 1996, Howard Zier, a restorative justice activist and photographer, published Doing Life, a book of photo portraits of individuals serving life sentences without the possibility of parole in Pennsylvania prisons. 25 years later, Zia revisited many of the same individuals and photographed them in the same poses. And still doing life, Zia and co-author Bob Taze present the two photos of each individual side by side along with interviews conducted at the two different photo sessions, creating a deeply moving of people who for the past quarter century have been trying to live meaningful lives while facing the likelihood that they will never be free. In the tradition of other compelling photo books, including Milton Roggeven's Tri Triptychs and Nicholas Nixon's The Brown Sisters Still Doing Life, offers a riveting longitudinal look at a group of people over an extended period of time. In this case, with complex and problematic impl implications for the American criminal justice system. Each night in the United States, more than 200,000 men and women incarcerated in state and federal prisons will go to sleep with the reality that they may die without ever returning home. There could be no more compelling book to challenge readers to think seriously about the consequences of life sentences. 
So as you can see, this is a very powerful book, um, you know, with, with real life stories attached to it, individuals who are in the midst of a, of a great battle, you know, facing incarceration, and look, some of them looking at never getting out. We are also joined today by one of the individuals featuring the group, Mr. Freddie Knoll. But first to get us started, um, I, I just wanna share with you guys that we will be looking for your engagement. This is a interactive type of event. So there is a QR code that we would love for you guys to scan so that you can engage in that discussion. If you're not able to access the QR code, you can type into your web browser, meet, that's M-E-E-T dot P-S slash Zer, Z-E-H-R. And that'll bring you to a web page where you can engage in conversation with the authors here and Freddie, who was featured in the book, as well as myself. So the first question that I have for you all, just to get us started, this question is for Howard, actually. How did this book come to be? Can you describe the timeline of events that led to this amazing project? <laughs> oh, yes, thank you. And good evening to all of you who are on here. Well, I had done this first book in 19, in the early 90s, as you know, uh, and I always wanted to go back uh, and it really wasn't possible. Uh, and then a, f a friend, the former head of psychological services for the Pennsylvania Department of Corrections, Lance Couturier, really wanted, he really loved this project and thought it ought to happen. And so he made it, he really was the key to getting this done. So, so then I got to go back. Um, I, I picked, I didn't want to be too ambitious. I was afraid I wasn't going to get permission. So I picked 22. I tended to pick from people who had done, in the early book, it had started out as an exhibit. So the, some of the interviews were fairly short, but I picked primarily from the long, longer interviews and kind of a diverse uh, selection of people and perspectives. Uh, and so that's basically how it came to be. Uh, Thank you, I appreciate that. You know, we, we have Freddie here with us. I'm gonna go ahead and share Freddie's bio with you all before I get into questions for Freddie. Um, so Freddie, John Freddie Knoll is a formerly confined person who spent over 49 years in prison after receiving a life without parole sentence as a juvenile. During his time in prison, his passions became whatever educational opportunities were available to better himself and organizational pursuits that benefited those in prison with him and their loved ones. His life was spiritually transformed when he accepted Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior in the late 1970s. After the life without parole sentence was deemed cruel and unusual punishment for a juvenile, Freddie was released on lifetime parole in 2019. Since that time, Freddie's passion has been using his experience to help others re-entering the free world from prison. He is currently working with Yoke Fellowship Prison Ministry in that capacity, as a council chairman and member of the board of directors. Freddie is also on the board of PAR Recycle Works. He is a native of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and is married for almost 38 years and has three sons, a daughter and two grandchildren. Welcome, uh, I wanna welcome Freddie, thank you for joining us. And I know you've been home for a few years now, but welcome home. I'm, I'm glad to see you here with us today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's very sure. much appreciated. Definitely. So I'm curious from, from your perspective, when you heard about this project, when they first contacted you, like what was your motivation to participate? Well, my, uh, first of all, thank you, Dr. Zare, for the opportunity to uh, help you again. Appreciate it. Uh, my motivation was strictly to uh, sensitize a society about life sentence prison, life sentence prison, prisoners you know, doing time in Pennsylvania. Uh, you know, I personally, and along with some associates, believe this sentence to be a throwaway of life, simple as that. You know, um, my motivation was to allow people to see that people can change, that some of the circumstances that people uh, get life sentences in Pennsylvania aren't warranted, and, you know, to energize uh, a prison reform movement uh, across the country. Uh, I know that's a lot, but that was my motivation for uh, just being one of the people at, the, at that time that felt that, they, that their sentence was egregious in, in so many different ways. And that the, uh, the system itself may not have uh, allowed me to survive it because 
It's a, it's not a rehabilitation system. It's a punishment system. And that was uh, primarily my motivation for being involved with Dr. Zare. Definitely. You know, that, that sounds like an amazing reason to get involved. And, you know, obviously we see that things can change because at the time of your first photo shoot and interview, you know, you were looking at doing life, never getting out. And eventually you ended up being released. So we do see that through criminal justice reform, through people getting out there, advocating, sharing their stories, we can see change within this very damaging system. So before we get to the next question, um, we have a few videos that we're going to share with you guys. It's excerpts from the book, from individuals. Um, the, the people reading it are not the, the individuals who are featured in the book, but it is their words and their story. So the first one we're going to share with you guys today is from Bruce Norris. Let's go ahead and get into that video and then we'll continue our discussion. I've been incarcerated for 42 years. It's a lot of wasted time. I've become a grandfather and a great grandfather. It was hard enough watching my children grow up. Now I'm watching my grandchildren become young adults. It's a little tough to deal with, but I always reflect back on the person I killed, what their family's going through, or that his children now have grandchildren and great grandchildren. At least I get to interact with my grandchildren and my children. I'm thankful for that. What keeps me going is that I've educated myself. I got my Bachelor of Arts degree from Villanova. I was in the dental lab for nine years. I got involved in different programs, restorative justice and alternatives to violence and groups like that. I read a lot more now since I graduated from college and I feel as though I can be an asset to young people coming in here. I have hope. I've always had a great spirit even before I came to prison. The way I keep it up is that I mind my business, educate myself. I wanna be a better person now than when I first arrived. I talk to young people a lot. I try to help them, give some of my education back to them. Things like that keep me going. I'm self-motivated and I take pleasure where I can find it. And I've always been a smiler ever since I was a kid. It's part of my DNA. I do have down times. I lost my mom several years back and it's still a soft spot for me. But I have to go on and do this time. I told myself when I first was incarcerated, your main focus is to survive. And I do that every day. I take that from my reading about the slave period. The older people said, don't go out there starting problems because the one thing we don't need if we are to survive is to cause problems and have everybody killed or harmed. If we survive, we can reach greater heights. That's my motivation. I like reading things by and about African Americans. I just finished reading the two Barack Obama books, Dreams from My Father and The Audacity of Hope. I've learned that no matter where you are, what you do, who you are, or who you think you are, you always have to give back. You have to reach down, reach back, and help others. And you can't do it for something in return. It's little things like writing or reading a letter for somebody or sharing books with people who might appreciate them. I give my time to young people because I wouldn't want my children to come into this institution and not have somebody who's older that they could look up to and be friends with. I tell them about my process and what I've been through. And they sit there listening. They don't cut me off. They allow me to speak. I always felt I should have been a counselor. I have a lot to say to them about how they should conduct themselves and what they should be getting involved in. I've always believed in the philosophy, each one teach one. I'm proud and satisfied where I am right here. Other than the fact that I don't know if I'll ever get out. I think I've done everything that's humanly possible to show that I deserve a second chance. I hope others will think so too. It's powerful, powerful stuff there. So in this excerpt, this question can be um, 
answered by, by anyone. So in this excerpt, Bruce, he talked about earning an education, you know, speaking to young people as much as possible, giving back, you know, he talked about each one, teach one, you know, it's pretty apparent that he's experienced tremendous growth despite his incarceration. I'm curious um, from the authors, was this a theme amongst many people featured in the book or was this unique to Bruce? I would say this is a theme that covered most people, if not everybody in the book. They all had their different ways about going about growing and educating themselves and relating in new ways. Um, but it definitely was a theme. And in the closing essay to the book, you know, we try and kind of bring that all together to understand, you know, what can we learn from what they're doing to understand how one copes with a life sentence. So it definitely was there. I'm curious how you would answer that, Freddie, from your own personal experience. Uh, for me, um, I went into prison very uneducated. Um, and I went in at a time where there really wasn't many opportunities to grow. So like basically in that, started in like 1972, they started introducing programs educational programs, young men programs like, like the JCs. And I just saw it as an opportunity to change my life. And I already had been told time and time again, you understand, don't waste time in this prison. You know, uh, do something that makes you valuable. So, and, and let's face it, I came from a society where I did a lot of damage as, as a young person. So finding a way to give back, you know, finding a voice, finding the meaning of purpose, you know, came very easy to me. You know, once I started on that track of being able to give something to somebody, you just feel as though you got to educate yourself. You got to, if you're going to give something to somebody, you got to be equipped with something to give. And, and that was my passion, just equipping myself to be able to give. You know, if I said something to somebody, you understand, and, and told them that there was help available to them, if I couldn't uh, point them in the direction to get it, then I gave it myself, you know, by putting out my energy for school education and, uh, and mentoring, you know, uh, I'm being mentored too. So yeah, you know, that, that was pretty much a theme, you understand, for growing up and surviving, you know, period. Definitely. You know, when, when individuals are incarcerated, you know, their body is physically incarcerated, but they cannot incarcerate your mind, you know. So while a lot of aspects of your life are put on hold, you know, socially and with family and things like that, you can still grow and develop. You know, you can become the honestly a best version of yourself, even while you're incarcerated, when you have access to programming and books. And that's another issue with a lot of individuals serving life sentences across the nation is that a lot of these things are just not available, right? They're, oh, you have too much time left or you're not getting out, so we're not gonna spend resources on programming for you. There might be an education program that comes into a facility and they say, oh, you're not eligible because you're serving a life sentence. But what Freddie just spoke to was the fact that there's a lot of benefits you know, for himself, for the other individuals that he's able to touch mm -hmm. when he has those opportunities to grow and learn and develop and things of that nature. Howard, did you have anything on that? No, I think he's absolutely right. Uh I found that most people, most people, they were trying to find a way to make meaning in their lives, to, to, to pay back for what they had done. So this was a, this is a very common theme. And, you know, I think too about one of the women in the book, she talks about how she's programmed out. She's done everything that there is to do. And so, you know, it one, it speaks to the ambition and the work and the involvement that so many of these men and women have, um, but also needing more and, you know, that question of what do we do when we've done everything? How do we keep finding that hope and keep finding that meaning in our lives? Sure, for sure. So yeah, another question that I have for you guys, you know, as it pertains to the book and like, you know, getting everything from the planning to the production, going from an idea to a finished product, like what, what are some of the obstacles that you had to overcome in order to make this thing a reality? I mean, one of the biggest one is getting permission. That's not at all easy. And it was really remarkable that that happened the second time around. Um, 
another obstacle, another challenge is everybody says such wonderful things. You know, I have interviewed hundreds and hundreds of people. I also did a book similar format with victims of severe crime. Everybody says something worthwhile. It's just amazing. And trying to get that down into a manageable <laughs> bite is really, really hard. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, hard. do you have any? <laughs> yeah, you know, there's always, you know, just the difficulty of getting a manuscript together, those sorts of things. But I really think about the men and women in the book really trusted us with their images and with their words. Yeah. And, um, you know, we take that really deeply and we honor that. And so not necessarily an obstacle, but a challenge is just being so respectful because people have given of themselves in it and making sure that we have portrayed them in the best way possible and been true to their words and um, are actually putting, you know, we're responsible for putting them out there and making sure that we do it in a way that really shines for their humanity and uh, respects who they are and the, really the gift that they've given us and the trust that they've given us to do that. For sure. Yeah. And I've, I've been in position, you know, interviewing folks and then having their work, even when you're going through transcription and things like that, there's just so many messages that can not come out right, you know, so it does take a deep trust you know, to share your story through another individual. So kind of along these lines, I was going to ask this question a little later in the discussion, but like speaking of trust and things of that nature, uh, this question is for you, Barb. So on page five of the uh, copy of the book that I have, which was a pre-publishing copy, mm -hmm. uh, is a page titled Acknowledging Our Bias and Language. Why was it important to include that in the book? Yeah, there were, there were kind of two things around why we wrote that section. Um, so often the words that we use to identify people who are incarcerated really um, shorten or make great social distance between us and people who are incarcerated and really create a us them and leave people as these unidimensional kinds of beings where it's easy to think of them as just a prisoner, just an inmate, um, a felon, a con. We know, we know what the words are that we use people. And so we wanted to be very clear that we wanted to reduce that social distance and that we were gonna really try and avoid the language of prisoner and inmate. And I, I don't think those words are anywhere that by our pen in that book. And instead wanted to use other words such as men and women. And um, you know, we talk about people who um, are responsible for causing harm and people who have been harmed and really trying to use humanizing language around that. Now we do use the language of lifer um, that is not generally considered a pejorative term. Um, and so we did use that language in the book. And, and when I say not usually considered a pejorative term, I mean by people who have this sentence. And um, we're also very aware, Howard and I are both white individuals. We come from privileged backgrounds. We have advanced degrees. Uh, financially, we're doing okay. And we don't represent those people who are disproportionately incarcerated. And so we wanted to just name that and call that out and be aware that, you know, be aware and let people know that we were aware of potential biases that we could be bringing into this process and that we understand their words through our lenses. So just wanting to acknowledge that because we think it's really important. Sure, appreciate that. So, I think right now we should probably transition into our second uh, video that we have from individual featured in the book, and that is Mr. Craig Batesman. So let's go ahead and watch Craig's video and then we'll get back to our discussion. I'll be 64 in June. I'm working on 35 years inside now and I'm taking it one day at a time. I realize how much faith I have and hope I had in the system 25 years ago because I still had appeals in. When all appeals are dead, you start looking for something else to keep you going. It's a challenge keeping hope alive. Now I'm at the commutation stage. When I went up in 2014, I had good support, even the full support of the victim's family, but it was right at the cusp of the Goober national election. And I only got one vote after the merit review hearing. I'm trying again in a year, I'm hopeful. I could have taken a deal, they offered me a deal for third degree, and the attorney said, third degree is probably the most that you're going to be convicted of anyway, so why take the deal? It's up to you. This was right when they were picking the jury. I could have had 10 to 20 year sentence and maxed out 15 years ago. That pulls at me. 
I had no real interaction in the criminal justice system at all before, so I didn't have any kind of understanding of what it was. Even my victim sister said that the district attorney told her, he's got a life sentence, but he'll be out in 17 years. After 20 years and I'm still not out, she started wondering why. Then another sister contacted the Apology Bank where we had sent the letters through the Victim Offender Reconciliation Program. And she started to look up on the internet and saw articles I had written. The meeting with the victim's family, telling her what actually happened, was the best thing in my whole incarceration. She told me what the loss meant to her and was understanding of what it's done to me and how I've changed and grown. It's rewarding to know that even after 35 years, they aren't hating you. Being vindictive or wishing you were dead, they're on my visitors list. Send letters and cards and have written letters for my commutation. I did a TEDx talk about it in Greater Ford. The reconciliation program was really rewarding. It was funny how the fruits of something that you did 10 years ago come back so much later. It just kept growing. A life sentence is death by incarceration, different from having the death penalty where you know you're going to get it on a certain date. Here, you're just sentenced to die while you're living here. You really struggle to find meaning in life and get through day by day. The meaning of life is fleeting and fickle. It's all what you make of it, meaning right now my jo is my job. I love computer programming. I love everything about it. I keep busy. I take part in programs like the Alternatives to Violence Project and the Lifers Organization. I finished my associate's degree. I worked in the dental lab for five years and 30 years in the correctional industries office. Programs like the reconciliation program and photography class give guys hope and a reason to get up or look forward. Once you get to a point where you're not doing anything, it gets a little melancholy. You can't sit around and do nothing. Everybody is anxious about the move from Greater Ford to Phoenix, the new prison. For all 35 years in, I never had a celly. But at the new prison we're moving to, every cell is a double. I'm hoping they'll let us choose our guys and they'll move in with an 82-year-old friend. I just want somebody who wants to be left alone. It's going to be a drastic change. I've grown a little bit more realistic as far as how tough the system is, no matter what your issues are in the court. I realize how important family is and how satisfying it is to help others. Tutoring other people, being there, sharing your experiences with them. It's more satisfying than constantly worrying about yourself and what you're going to do next or accomplish. I think that comes with maturity. A lot of powerful stuff there, you know, from the conversation about the relationship with his victims to being sentenced to death by incarceration to the educational aspects, just such a powerful excerpt there. So Craig, he spoke about connecting with his victim's family and having their support for his release. The family seemed to be very forgiving. Do you believe that stories like Craig's can play a role in shifting to a more forgiving society as a whole? And either, either of you three can answer this. I'd love to hear from all three of you. Well, if you don't mind, I'll chime in first. Um, and I'm gonna say no. And here's why. Because in, in the grammar scheme of things, the, these people don't even know what's going on behind the scenes. They don't know what prejudice is, you know, that uh, the system holds for people that like, like Craig, like others, like Bruce, you understand, that demonstrate the ability to want to change and help others, sometimes that don't go over well in prison. Challenging the system for better programming, uh, uh, family involvement, uh, more education so you can be properly prepared whenever you, know, you have the opportunity to leave. For most lifers, you have to literally make your way. The system do not call lifers in to say, oh, you know, uh, come on and get an education, come on and get involved in this program because, you know, we got something for you. No, they don't have anything for you. You got to admire people like Craig, like Bruce, and even myself that just decide to try to be in whatever number comes up for you by being the best that you can. It, it don't always work out that way. You know, they, a lot of times they don't consider the, um, the, the depth of your education and your giving in prison. They re if you don't keep your own records of your, your personal involvement and growth and understanding, a lot of times that information even is, isn't even in your records. So, you know, family uh, outside playing a part is very, very, I would say, 
very minute. It, it, it holds a heavy bit of weight for the person to know that the family or somebody that you've done damage to is willing to forgive you. If you're spiritual for me, you know, that, you know, that's big. A family member forgiving me, that puts me in line with my, my faith base. But as far as the institution is concerned, they may look at that as a manipulation and, and just keep on stepping. For sure, I appreciate you sharing your perspective. And I know, you know, even when an individual is not serving a life sentence, the collateral consequences of just interacting with the system, having criminal convictions, it can follow you for a lifetime where society almost wants to give you a life sentence, even if the judge didn't. But I'm curious to hear from um, Barb and Howard, what do you guys think about that as far as um, sharing these stories do you think that it can possibly lead to a more forgiving society? Well, you know, I'm thinking first about Craig meeting with the victim or the surviving victims of the person that he killed. And, you know, that process, you know, just loosely call it victim offender dialogue is part of the restorative justice philosophy. And I'm sure some people listening now are familiar with that. But with restorative justice, it starts from the place of the victim and how they've been hurt and what are their needs and then designing a justice process to attend to those needs. And you know, I think some of the things that Freddie has spoken to is that prison isn't attending to some of those needs, needs that the person who committed the harm has and needs that the surviving um, victims have. And so if we would do justice in a way where victims can get their needs met, where the person who caused the fatal harm are in the position where they can do what they need to do and fulfill the obligations, and it's not a political process, which we hear from Craig in this piece, and then Freddie, you've suggested it as well. I like to think that we as a society can actually move to doing justice differently, whether that always means that people are going to forgive, I don't know if that's required. But I do think, um, you know, if we if we start addressing people's needs when they've been hurt, I do think we can get to a place in society where we think about justice very differently. Um, do I think it's going to happen next week? That I'm not sure, but I know for myself, um, and you know, hopefully from this book and people, you know, hearing about these real voices, and then also. Howard has another book, Transcending, that he mentioned with survivors, um, that I like to think that these type of books and these different ways of thinking about doing justice can make a shift. I'm, I'm hopeful, I'm optimistic. My, my goal in these books is really, you know, so much of our discussion around crime and justice is done in terms of stereotypes, generalizations, labels. My goal in these books is to let people present themselves without the stereotypic clues that, so that we will listen to real people. And so you'll notice the photographs, they don't show bars. They, they show people the way I would want to be shown. Uh, you don't, it, it, I took a, created a little studio inside the prison. I did the same thing with my book for Survivors of Crime. But the goal is so we have to confront, listen to, interact with real people instead of stereotypes and generalizations. And I think that, I, my hope is that that can make a difference. Sure. I'm going to show a few slides here so that people can um, see what these look like in the book. So there's Freddie. There's Freddie. Woohoo! <laughs> then I think this is Bruce, who you heard from earlier. And um, just a word about Bruce while we're looking at his picture. Um, he has since died in prison. Um, he got a unanimous vote recommendation. Uh, for commutation, which then needed to be signed by the governor. And sadly, while his application for commutation was sitting on the governor's desk, he died from COVID. So he sadly didn't actually get out, even though he was this close to doing that. But I'll just flip through a few more of these. Yeah, I think I'll ask another question while you're doing that. So we're talking about like forgiveness and the way society will um, receive a book like this and hearing these stories. One of, one, of the, one of the things that I know, um, well, there's this common phrase that hurt people hurt people, right? There's a lot of individuals who have committed crimes, um, violent crimes, nonviolent crimes. And before that ever took place, before they had ever victimized anyone, they had been victims themselves, many from childhood, right? Early child abuse, um, 
lot of neglect, a lot of abandonment, sexual abuse, things of that nature. I was wondering, is, is trauma, uh, not just trauma for, for the victim side, but for the individuals who are interviewed, was that, was that also a theme uh, that came out during these interviews, trauma that had been experienced? Definitely. Um, when we were working on this manuscript, I was actually enrolled in two different trauma classes to improve my own knowledge about trauma and trauma healing in particular. And as we were pulling together the interviews and doing the editing and things like that, and these themes that were coming up, I was like, oh my gosh, this is all about trauma healing and started to really go back and reread some of the interviews and realize all these connections um, between experiences with trauma, the trauma of incarceration, the trauma of actually um, harming other people, but then these really amazing ways that they were using getting an education, helping others, thinking about the people that they had hurt, how these were all forms of healing for them and that they were on this pretty amazing healing journey themselves. And so we actually close off the book with an essay kind of looking at what people have read through the trauma lens and the, particularly the trauma healing lens. So it's not just about you know, the trauma that they've experienced, but also their ability to transcend that and really persevere. Appreciate that. Howard or Freddie, do you guys have anything on that? Um, well, you know, for me, I, st I started being incarcerated uh, when I was like eight or nine years old. And um, from like 1959 to about like 1968, I had stints in and out uh, of the system. And, and, and yeah, you know, uh, that first experience of being traumatized, being taken away from my family and not understanding why, because, and, and when I say not understanding why is because when I finished that little bit, they stuck me right back in the same environment. You understand? And it was like, you know, back in survival mode, you know, you didn't, they didn't have support networks at that time. They should have, but they didn't. So, you know, my thing was the streets. So yeah, that was a lot of trauma that always had me feeling as though I could pay the system back. When in reality, once I went to prison in uh, 1969 and, and, you know, started developing my education and understanding who was really being hurt, you understand, by me trying to pay the system back was me. Uh, the gaps in between uh, watching sisters grow up, three or four brothers dying, my mother dying, my, my father dying. That, that was all trauma that I had to work through time and time again. And, you know, the system didn't help me do that. You know, I mean, they didn't, they didn't have the tools for me to do that. I found the tools myself by, you know, just believing that at this point in time, I had, I could find something better to do with my life. And, and, and that was it. But yeah, trauma was definitely uh, what motivated me, you understand, from the time I was like a, a preteen until I was like at least 20 or 21. Thank you for sharing that with us. Howard, do you have anything on that? They've said it well. I don't think I need to add anything. <laughs> All right, cool. So um, let's go ahead and move into our final video. This is Yvonne Cloud. We'll go ahead and watch Yvonne's video and then continue our discussion. I'm more outspoken and mature now. I found my voice and I'm able to express myself. I'm coping in a better and more positive way that will benefit me as well as others in the community. Back then, when I was first interviewed, I was somewhat shy still in denial, didn't want to talk that much or let anybody know I had a life sentence. I still have the same determination to do positive things and give back to other people and <clears throat> change their lives for the better. I took a life, now I try to save lives. Even though I'm here, I can still make a difference and guide other people in the right direction. Peachy was definitely an influence on me. 
She met me at a time when I was in my 20s, acting like a little kid, running around and doing the wrong things. I had all this potential, and Peachy brought that out of me. It was a sad day when she passed away on Palm Sunday. It was like the whole campus stopped because she inspired so many people. I spent years and years facilitating groups, everything I could grab, inspired by Peachy. I worked 10 years in the drug and alcohol therapeutic community. I recently became a certified peer specialist. I go all over campus helping the young offenders, letting them know that even though they're here, they still can make good choices and not repeat their mistakes. I go door to door in the mental health unit, inspiring and motivating people, letting them know that there is hope. They can change. People have done it. I also work in admissions, so I talk to women as they come to the prison, letting them know about all the positive this institution has to offer. People come here and make things so much harder for themselves than it has to be. They come here with two to four years and end up doing the whole four years when they don't have to. It's all in the way we think. If you think positive, nine times out of ten, you're going to do positive things. If you think negative, your behavior is going to reflect that. In 1993, I came close to getting my degree before they snatched away the Pell Grants. I had training for the hospice program. I worked in Project Impact for five years. I received the Lisa Wagner Award in 2004 for all the good things I've done as far as school. I received the Inmate of the Year Award in 2006. I've been doing a lot of positive things for a long time. Even though I don't know what the future holds, I'm determined to stay on the straight and narrow and continue to help other people. Pay it forward. Teach others what somebody taught me. That's what I do mostly, even on weekends. These activities make me feel good about myself, knowing that I'm helping change other people's lives. I'm very busy, but I make sure to get my rest. <laughs> it's mandatory or I wouldn't be able to do any of this. Most of the older lifers are mentors. You have some life, it's sad to say, who are still bitter, <clears throat> angry about their situation, like there's no hope. Then you have the ones like me who just want to make the best of our situation and help others along the way. People ask me, oh my God, how do you ever do so much time? I say, well, huh, I have no choice in the matter. All I can do is the best I possibly can. Take one day at a time sometimes one second at a time, and keep my head up high and be as strong as I can and give back to other people. I always remind my family that I'm strong and tell them all the things I do every day. I don't want them worrying about me. Some people go by what they see on TV. And they don't know. They never been here. So it's our job to let them know that we're okay. I try my best to keep them strong and let them know that I'm taking good care of myself. Thank God my son has never been in trouble. Doing life is in the library. It reached all over the campus. A lot of people really appreciate that. And a lot of them didn't know about life sentences. Some inmates walk by us every day and don't have a clue unless they sit down and talk to us. The book brought up a lot of people's awareness about life sentences and how we cope with it from day to day. It has taken me many years to forgive myself for the wrongs I've done. I didn't have any right to take the life of another human being, and I have deep remorse for doing so. If I could turn back the hands of time and make a difference, a different choice, I would, but I can't. Today, I'm still suffering the consequences for my actions on that fateful day 37 and a half years ago. Once again, very, very powerful. I do want to remind the audience that um, we'll be engaging in the audience discussion, either through a, the QR code that was shared with you earlier or at meet.ps slash zeer, that's M-E-E-T dot P-S slash Z-E-H-R, where you can put your questions in to engage with our trio here. Um, so Yvonne mentioned that her educational opportunity seized in 1993 when Pell Grants were taken away. Well, in December, 2020, Pell Grants were reinstated for incarcerated people. 
There's also there was a bill in um, the state of Washington, SB 5036, that was introduced. There's something that would allow those sentenced to life at a chance of being released. They can go petition um, for their release. As, as many know, in the state of Washington, we don't have parole here, which we have in some other states. So this bill would allow something like parole. And it's kind of controversial. You know, some of the biggest opponents were victims of Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer, who would potentially be eligible to ask for release under the law. Doesn't mean he would get it, but he'd be able to ask for release under the law. So I'm curious, um, are you aware of any other legislation, not just in Washington state, but across the nation that positively impacts individuals such as those featured in the book? Yeah, there's increasingly more and more states that are looking at having, you know, second chance acts or you know things like that either geared at juveniles so that you know just helping them get out and kind of moving that forward since the supreme court decision um but also looking more national kinds of things we're looking at you know at, at 20 years setting it up that people can ask for parole um and really doing away with life without the possibility of parole and at least giving people a chance to ask for parole so there is more and more happening in that regard um, you know, there's challenges. There's definitely people who are opposed to it, people who are very much in support of it. Um, and, you know, we're hoping with this book that, you know, people start thinking and kind of reflecting on this issue, its human impact, um, how it fits into one's understanding of justice and whether it's really a good way to do justice and just generally contribute to the conversation that's happening about life without the possibility of parole. Freddie, can you speak a little bit about um, the change that led to your release? Uh, yeah, um, you know, God bless Brian Stevenson, first of all. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I went to I went to jail. I was seventeen um, when uh, uh, I was nineteen when I actually got my uh, life sentence, but I was seventeen when I committed my crime. Uh, the guy that was my victim died of an aneurysm during the course of a robbery. And uh, that that was the foundation for my life sentence. Um, but I fought my, I had fought my case uh, from a juvenile perspective of the law ever since, you know, from day one. Once I started learning how to read and write and, you know, could understand the law, I fought my case uh, tooth and nail. But that was the that's the only thing that got me out of jail. I, I seriously uh, believe that. I believe, you know, of course, that God had His hand on Brian. You know, you know, her, hearing prayers, He touched Brian. Go up there and take care of that. You know, but um, there's there there wasn't a lot, you know, uh, 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 for us to look forward to. Our commentation system uh, in, in Pennsylvania went to a unanimous vote rare. Uh, uh, the, the greatest number of life sentence prisoners that were released were uh, prior to the 80s. You know, after that, some some years, guys, there was no commutations at all. And the population in Pennsylvania has grown uh, uh, significantly, you know, over them years. Uh, so our only saving grace right now, as far as like uh, new law, was our 850 bill that that said that if you committed a you know homicide at the age of uh, be, you know below 17 below 18 that now they could only give you anywhere between 20 25 and 35 years to life unfortunately those guys that's being sentenced specifically under that still won't be eligible for parole until like 2032 so, you know, that even that sentence is a long way off. But I don't want to belabor this, but the biggest thing is not giving people that you put in jail for all that time opportunities to grow, that the system is not providing enough opportunities for people to grow and see a way forward. You know, if they don't give you anything, you know, like they want you to change and they look at change but they don't give you anything to change with. And that's the biggest uh, uh, downfall, I think, in, in our, in, at least in our system here in Pennsylvania. 
Yeah, and I think I think when we're thinking about what kind of reforms we want, we need to be asking ourselves, you know, what are the conditions and the environment and um, the relationships that we can be building with people so that we achieve the goals that we want. And if we want people to um, change and grow, and if we want people to be accountable for harm that they've caused, then we need to be thinking about what are the best ways to do that. And asking ourselves, is a life sentence without the possibility of parole the best way to go about getting the outcomes that we're looking for? Sure. Yeah, so we, we only had a couple of audience questions, so I'm gonna go ahead and get those in. And I think we might have time to ask you guys for a last word after that. So the first question is actually speaking to kind of what you were just saying, Barb. Um, what are the policy reforms that we should be fighting for right away to begin to transform our justice system? Well, that's an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think there's a lot of different avenues to uh, make reform. And do we want to reform or do we want to totally transform and start from scratch? So where do we want to have that conversation? I, we, we only got eight minutes, so I don't know whether we'll get to the meat of it. But you know, I think really looking at um, restorative justice initiatives, how can we better meet the needs of victims and um, doing justice in a way that does that and really holds people accountable in very meaningful ways, as opposed to just kind of these, you know, short and simple punitive kind of ways. Um, there's also some really great work that's happening around what we call transformative justice, which is really looking at what are the social structures that are going on, including racial justice and racial inequity that are contributing to um, disproportion severe disproportionality in the criminal justice system and people who are even bringing those together um, in really some amazing ways, including in Seattle. Um, and, um, you know, I think really looking at, um, you know, these extreme sentences, um, can we spark start some momentum of reducing them, um, getting, getting rid of them. Some people would argue we need to abolish them. Um, I certainly have my position on what I think should happen, but you know, with the book, we just want people to begin thinking um, about these sorts of things um, and finding the people that are doing some of the um, work that you wanna be doing. We certainly can also be having conversation about you know, what does it mean to um, abolish prisons? What does it mean to defund the police? And what does that mean for the kind of society that we want to be creating for ourselves? Mm. So with the time that we got, that's what I got. For sure. <laughs> Freddie, Howard, you guys on? Yeah, well, you know, like Barb said, you know, you, you, uh, for me, uh, I think we need a dynamic within our systems to look at people before those sentences that they give them, you know, okay, we have, you know, the statute calls for a certain sent sentence of a person, but we need to look at what circumstances brought those people to prison in the first place. A lot of them is, you know, poverty, uneducation, you understand, uh, bad home situations, uh, uh, domestic, uh, not having, uh, any real understanding of family orientation, community orientations. You know, if a guy comes to prison and suddenly he comes to prison at 18 or 19 and at 25, he gets a spark and changes his life around, we got to reward that. We got to be able to come back and say, look, this guy got a 40 year sentence. He's got 15 years in. Let's see, let's see if we can you know, do something with him. Let, let's see where he's at. But we don't have that. So a lot of a lot of sentence are overkill. And like I say, you can't you can't take away the fact that it's disproportionately given. Uh, one more thing I want to say is like we got a district attorney uh, uh, in, in Philadelphia, uh, Kurt Larry Krasner. I give him props because right now he's under he's undoing almost. 40 years of where people were arbitrarily given sentence, bad sentences, just because the color of their skin and their social um, position. You know, we need people to look at the person, the environment and everything that contributes to a person coming to prison 
and putting their life in situations that are not normal in our society. Appreciate that. You know, I wanna just quick give a shout out to a book. Um, Danielle Sered's Until We Reckon is a really great book that's looking at um, restorative justice and policy change. Where can we actually make policy change? She has amazing um, chapter nine points in which you can interact with the system to try and make change. So if anyone um, is interested in doing further reading on restorative justice and linking it to some of the bigger issues as well as policy change and how we understand what prosecutors do, what law enforcement does, collateral consequences of incarceration, I highly recommend um, until we reckon. Mm. And, and our book, of course. <laughs> Thank you. So many of the men and women that I talked to really had a burden to keep from keep other people from doing what they did. They, they worked hard inside the prison with people, as, as Yvonne Cloud said, who are come with women who are coming in, but, but they long, they, they have so much to contribute. Uh, you know, Harry Twiggs, in, who's in the book, Harry said, we, we have two lives. There's the first life and we do these terrible things, but there's a second life where we've learned from that and we can help others not to do those things. And it, the, one of the tragedies is we're not using that resource. Uh, and so many of the people that was, they talked so, so meaningfully about their wish to do that. Appreciate that. Yes, yeah, so I, I don't know um, if we have a hard stop at seven, if it's okay to go a little bit over. We did get a couple late um, questions from the audience. Okay, cool, a little over is okay, cool. So the next question from the audience is for Freddie. It's, I'm curious, what's the most important advice you give young people mm -hmm. who have recently been released from their incarceration? Uh, for me, I would say, you know, take a breath and realize that you have the opportunity to start a new life. You know, for me, you know, I had a nice support system. You know, I was married. Uh, my wife did a fine job of painting the portrait that other people saw of me when I got out. Um, and, and we just need to, like, understand that we still have value. You know, one of the things that prison does give you the opportunity if you take it. They're not going to give it to you. You got to, you got to mind. This, this is gold. So you got to go into the stream and, and sort of like, you know, sift it out. But there's value. You know, value, value for me was being able to finally help other people, you know, to give of myself something sincere, something that uh, wasn't paid for, bargained for, just seeing the need and having the ability to help fulfill that. So I think getting out for you, for anybody, you understand, look at what you can contribute rather than what you need. Hmm. Appreciate that. When we interviewed Freddie after he was out, he said, I always like this quote, this is like the first fruit that I've ever had and it's quite delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Doc. <laughs> yeah, so this is probably yeah. going to be our last audience question here. Um, so it says, TV and film usually portray prison and prisoners in the worst possible way. Are there any fictional portrayals of jail that get it right, in your opinion? Mm. Mm. Not much of a connoisseur, though, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a simple answer. <laughs> yeah, no. Yeah, I'm with Freddie on that one. You know, as someone who's formerly incarcerated, I know that um, t television is about the dramatized parts, right? <laughs> it's not going to show, you know, um, the, the normal day to day that people are going through in there. Okay. So I was given permission to ask one last question since that was a short answer. Um, <laughs> The last question is, how does your faith impact your work? I know Freddie spoke about his faith in his bio. I'm not, if Barb and Howard have an answer to that, then that would be good. I come from a Mennonite faith, 
that actually Barb does too. Mm. And rooted in that, it's really rooted in, it's a piece, it's a, tr a traditional peace church. And it's one where the, the values of justice and peace were really embedded in me. And also some of the, what I call the core values of restorative justice, the emphasis on respect, the emphasis on relationship with other people, uh, the other, the emphasis on responsibility. So those, those values have really informed and motivated me. Uh, Barb, do you want to? Yeah, like Howard said, I'm, I grew up Mennonite and would still connect with that particular faith and very strong social justice orientation. And my parents both worked in an international relief and development organization that was run by the Mennonites. And so I, I was just raised in justice and equality and giving back. And this idea of ask what you can contribute um, rather than what you can get from other people really was um, just what I was steeped in um, all the time. And so ever since I was a young age, I've had this strong sense of justice and my parents can tell you lots of stories uh, about that. And they're, they're actually listening here, so I'm sure they're chuckling. But um, it's really been part of just who I am. And um, I fell into doing criminal justice work when I did voluntary service right out of my undergrad years with the Mennonite organization. And it, it just was so clear that restorative justice was going to be my passion and what I always did. So it's very much grounded in, in my faith. Nice. Freddie? Ma'am. Yeah, um, I, 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 I uh, came to the Lord while I was in prison. Uh, the last uh, 30 years of, uh, of my bid, I spent working with the uh, Yo Fellowship program and uh, I've continued that on the outside, but uh, yeah, faith, faith for me was, 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 was my discipline, you know, uh, looking, looking to God for guidance and, and temperament, uh, looking into myself first, uh, when, if somebody, like, if I offended somebody, rather than think that uh, they did something to me, I, I looked to see what I might have done if I spoke to him wrong or looked at him wrong or had an expression of uh, prejudice or what have you. These are the things that my religion uh, helped me uh, to uh, develop and, 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 and grow with. So when I, you know, out here in, in society, it's easy. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm serious. It, it's easy. You know, you go to church and you, you, you do what you can you, you share what uh, the goodness that God has given to you. And, and right now, uh, my faith is in God, that the things I want to do out here, because I believe it's uh, oriented in, in, in who he is and, and what he's done, that I'll, I'll probably be successful. And I'm willing to be patient and uh, wait for God to open the doors for me that I hope he will. Well, he gave me a marriage in prison for 37 years. And, 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 you know, my wife was at the door waiting for me. So, uh, yeah, I, you know, and that was really a transformation of uh, finding a wife in prison that would, would stay with you from day one, you know, stand until the end. And uh, she, she's still doing that. But it was all based on God changing who I was and uh, teaching me uh, commitment. Thank you for that. So unfortunately, we have reached um, the end of our time. I do want to give the three of you, before I pass it to our um, town hall folks to close us out, just one sentence from each of the three of you to close us out, just one final word. I, I know there's a little bit of pressure in that, but mm -hmm. I do want them to hear just one final word from you all, whether it's about the book, whether about it's about one of the issues that are covered in the book, reform, whatever. I just want to give you guys a chance to leave the audience with one final word. I just want me, to go, go ahead, ahead, Doc. No, go for me, it's there. just forgiveness. Uh, we, you know, I believe firmly that uh, my religion and, and believing in Christ is founded on forgiveness. And, and once we can do that, we, we can move mountains. And I just want to express my deep gratitude to the men and women who trusted us with their stories and with their photographs and, and with the new press who treated this with as a sacred, sacred space, a sacred material, and, and worked so hard to, to 
to make sure it was done with integrity. And so I'm very thankful for that, as well as all the people that in the system and outside the system that helped make this possible. Sure. Yeah, and, and mine would be appreciation for the men and women that are in the book. And, you know, I'm also thinking about um, the surviving family members of the men and women in the book and uh, just thinking about them and also very appreciative of the some of the victim service community in Pennsylvania who um, are connected with these people who are supportive of the book and in wanting to help get this word out as well. And Omari, I want to give you a shout out. So yes. um, as, as a last word um, for the absolutely, you know, we want people to, to check out our book, but um, here it is as a reminder. Um, but also Amari has four books out as well. Um, so check them out, two children's book books and two others. So they can also be um, purchased through Elliott Bay Bookstore. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to engage in discussion with you all. Let's go ahead and pass it back to Town Hall to Seattle to close us out. Uh, thank you, Amari. God bless you, man. On behalf of Town Hall Seattle, I just want to thank you all in our audience for being here and to our speakers as well, Freddie, Bob, Bar Barb, Howard, and Amari. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Still Doing Life is available at the Elia Bay Book Company. You can purchase it uh, with a link in the chat on the video right there. Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you.